Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love Online. No matter what's going on in this day and age, no matter what's happening, no matter what is going on personally or publicly, the bottom line is there's no need to fear. There's no need to get stressed out. There's no need to pull your hair out from the roots. God is in control. If God is for you, who can be against you? When we have his favor, we want to stay on his good side. All right. So let me go on and start reading Psalms 18 again, starting at verse 1. I will love thee, O Lord, my God. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. You know, I want to say this real quick for the sake of understanding. When you see something in the Bible that says even this or even that, it's almost like saying, uh, and, or it's almost like saying, um, how can I say it? Like, uh, especially into his ears, or it's not like an added thought. It's just making sure that you know, it's, it's as if I read, and my cry came before him into his ears. Even, I don't know why they do that in antique language, but it kind of changes the mode. But if you knock out the even and just read it, you'll get more of a sense of what it's really saying. It's not an afterthought when it says even, okay, like it is when we say it. I just had to throw that in. Throw that in. Verse 7, when the earth shook and trembled, the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth, devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. Now, this is what I love about him. When he comes to our rescue, nothing stops what he's going to do on our behalf. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion round about him with dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hails, hailstones, and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomforted them. Discomfort means he made them really nervous. He scared the boo-boo out of them. Okay. Then the channels of water were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. Think of that. He brought me forth into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Sometimes I got to stop there for a minute. Sometimes you feel like your life is, is precarious. You feel like you're on a slippery slope. Like you could fall and and crack a rib at any second. Something could go wrong at any moment. Like the anvil, the the, uh, proverbial anvil or the axe is hanging over your head waiting to come down and chop your head off. The slightest wrong move can cause a horrible line of disasters in your life. But what God is saying is when he's for you, when he's working on your behalf, when he comes to your rescue, Nothing can harm you. And knowing that nothing can harm you, picture yourself 
landing in a large place. In other words, he puts you on steady ground. The ground is large. Your your inheritance is large. Your blessings are, are big time. And when your feet land, you, you land flat-footed. You're strong. Your stance is strong. You're balanced. You're not off balanced. You're not in a second getting ready to fall. No, you're standing strong because God placed a level ground under you. He's got you. He is your foundation. So when he's coming to you to your rescue and he's positioning you, you can't fall because you're in his hands. You're safe and nothing shall by any means harm you. Amen. Okay. Just in case I had to throw that little two cents in real quick. Okay. So I love this when he says, that's uh, verse 19 is what I just got through describing. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me. That's the other thing. You want God to rescue you when when the, the, the big boogeyman is coming at you, when you feel like you're under hot pursuit and the devil's got a name on you, an assignment on you, guess what? Live as holy as you can, baby. Do everything God's way. Don't cuss anybody out. Don't go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Don't use spite. You hear what I'm saying? Don't let malice have anywhere in your heart. Don't even allow unforgiveness to be in your heart. Even if you're not acting on it, you don't even want that in you. You don't want anything to short circuit God's rescue. Amen. All right. So because when God promises to come to the rescue of the holy and the righteous, he's got to live up to it. And the only way you can you can almost force his hand, so to speak, I'm saying it in jest, is by living in that level where he's got to fulfill his promise to you. That's how you've got to do it. Okay. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. Okay. Now let's go down. I already read that. 21. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Now that does not mean that you do not do anything wrong, that you don't slip up. Nope. What that means is your heart is right. Your intentions are right. Your motives are right on point. But every once in a while, pressure might hit and you might flare up and oh, I acted ugly, but you got to hurry up and make that right. Oh, please forgive me for, for uh, snapping at you. I didn't mean to do that. That wasn't you. That was me being worried about something else and I shouldn't even be worried. So forgive me. You know, you hurry up and, and rectify what you just made a mess of. You don't let it lay there. And you ask God to forgive you. Stay in his forgiveness. Stay in the realm of his mercy. All right. Humble yourself. And if you have mistreated someone publicly, apologize publicly. Verse 22, for all his judgments were before me. And I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him. And I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. This is the part I love right here. This is why, and I got to stop here and elaborate a minute. This I'm getting ready to read is why you need to ask God to help you at every turn to be as merciful, not be a doormat. That's not what merciful means, but be as merciful and forgiving as possible. Be kind to the froward. You hear what I'm saying? Don't go toe to toe, word for word, fist for fist, blow for blow. No, it ain't about that. I for an eye, no. Be merciful. Do good to them that do wrong by you. Don't do wrong by them. All right. Now, this is the reason. With the merciful. Thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with an upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. What that means is the way I treat Lynn, the way I treat Jeanette, the way I treat Peter, the way I treat Anthony, the way I treat Dr. Dotson, the way I treat Sister Edna, 
Whoever I'm treating, whoever I'm relating to, a member of my family, my cousin, my niece, my brothers, however I treat them is the way God's going to treat me. Hello. And my question to you on that one is how do you treat others? Here's another question. Some of you think because your parents, you have a carte blanche on how you deal with your kids. How do you treat your kids? Because baby cakes, if God's not happy with how you treat your kids, God will treat you in like manner. Think about that one. Hmm. And here's the rest of it. 26. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. Like I said, you don't want to be on God's bad side. And you, the, a good way to get on his bad side, quick, fast, and hurry, is by treating others, by mistreating them, by abusing them, by overstepping your privilege as a supervisor and lording over the heritage you have and browbeating your workers. God knows how to browbeat, baby. You do not want him to browbeat you because his whooping is a whole lot worse than anything you can do to someone else. All right. So, for thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. So you be careful how you look at other people because God knows how to bring you down, baby. He will drop your drawers in public and show all your nastiness to everyone. That means exposure. You do not want God to expose you. So be careful how you deal with other people and their faults. Be careful how you deal with other people and their shortcomings or weaknesses or maladies. Be careful how you deal with them. Because God's got payday. And you do not want to write a check or get a check that you can't cash. All right, here we go. Uh, I said it nicely. There's another way to say that, but I'm going to be nice. All right. 28. For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. So for those of you who have been victimized, for those of you who have been unfairly treated, understand God's got your light. And it ain't a train coming through the tunnel. It's a light at the end of the tunnel. And that light is reserved for you. And with the light comes blessings, favor, benefits. But you must keep check on your heart. Keep malice out of your heart. Keep guile out of your heart. Pray hard when people are being hard on you. Pray hard for God to help you be graceful and a, a class act going through it. For by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God have I leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Mm, mm, mm. I'm going to stop there for a second. Because I want you to think about how when God is for you, and that scripture says, who can be against you? See, when God has favor on you, no matter what, things just always work out for you. They just, you, know, you don't have to work so hard. You don't have to bust a sweat trying to make things happen all the time. There are times when God wants you to put forth an effort, and it may be an arduous task while you're pressing in to get it done. But there comes a point where God rewards you. And he says, okay, now I'm going to throw these pieces in place for you. You don't have to work for all of it. I want you to work a little bit because I'm teaching you something. I'm imparting something in your spirit. I'm helping you. I'm helping you grow and develop in certain areas. But when I see you giving it your all, oh, I got some extra goodies. It's going, <laughs> you're going to feel like you're getting bonuses galore on your left and on your right. God honors effort. God honors your sincere uh, uh, 
Uh, your, the energy you put forth trying to please him, trying to live a holy life, trying to do right by others, even when they're not doing right by you. God honors that because the way you treat others, in essence, is the way you're treating him. That's the way he takes it. He takes what you do with other people personally. That's what that, that is something right there. That's why he says to the pure, I will show myself pure. To the merciful, I will show myself merciful. He takes it personally. So when you look at that on the flip side and you see people that mistreat people, God takes that personally. So be very careful how far you press the envelope because payday's coming and you think you're getting away because you got the promotion stepping on someone else's head. You got the promotion taking the credit for the sweat, the blood, sweat, and tears someone else put into a project. You got all the credit and your name is on it, but you didn't have a nickel in that dime. And you kicked them to the curb while you stepped up on top of them to get your honors. But see, those honors won't last long because there still comes payday. And God has his day. He has his way in the whirlwind. And when he sends a whirlwind your way, God's going to have his way in it. And you will see that that is your payday, not the reward that you got, not the promotion you got, not that big bonus check. No, that's not going to be worth a hill of beans when God gets through raking your behind over the coal for how you treated the one that got you there. You watch how you treat people. He takes it personally. All right, here we go. Woo! All right, uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter 8, starting at verse 6. I got to start at verse 5. That's where it starts. The Lord spake also unto me, saying, For as much as this people refuses the water of Shiloh that go softly and rejoice in resin and rebellious sun, now therefore behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even the neck and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. Mm. Associate yourselves, O my people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, O ye of far countries. Gird yourself and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. In other words, it'll fall through. Nothing will come of it. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spake thus with me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people saying, say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. In other words, don't be intimidated by them either. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread and he shall be for a sanctuary. Let me stop this real quick. I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to read verse 14, but this is what's coming to me. Some of you, I don't know why this is, I guess this is the message, but some of you are in situations, whether you're in church, whether you're, and you're going through the chain of command, whether you're on the job, whatever your position is, or even in politics for that matter. And people above you are intimidating you. People above you are coercing you to go against your own conscience, to go against what you know is right. God is saying, don't line up with that crap. I don't care if it costs you your job. Don't line up with it. Because whatever you lose, for God's sake, God will restore to you a hundredfold. He will give you so much more when he blesses you with a replacement for what you think you're losing. Don't worry about what you're losing, baby. 
Because if you got God on your side, you're winning no matter what they take from you. So be careful not to allow fear, intimidation, coercion, threats, loss. Don't let any of that cause you to bow to the ways of Satan, to bow to Baal, to bow to, to oppression. Don't do that. Let God alone be your fear, your reverential fear. Let God alone be your trust. Trust in him, not in this nonsense that this world is caught up in. Don't get caught up in that. Some of you want to see results quick, fast, and hurry. So instead of waiting on the Lord, you lean on witchcraft. You lean on tarot cards. You go the way God told you not to go because of your impatience. It's either fear, impatience, or pride, or even greed. Don't let that cause you to trip yourself up. You better stay on the good foot while you're there. You do not want to get on God's bad side. Let me finish reading. Mm, mm, mm. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And as many among them shall stumble and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared. That means trapped, stuck, caught, and he, and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel, for the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? For the living to the dead? You know how the angel talk to the disciples and said, why seek ye the living among the dead? People do it all the time in this day and age. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I don't care. Now this is Pat now. I don't care if a person can quote scripture backwards, forwards, inside out, and upside down. Mm -hmm. If they're also dabbling in the occult, if they're also going to these wicker stores, casting spells and doing little potions and incantations, and they're calling it Christian witchcraft, that is not only an oxymoron, that is also a total contradiction. God does not contradict himself. Truth does not contradict itself. And you should not contradict your faith. Because once you step on that other platform, you have totally turned your back on God. Because God sees all of that as witchcraft. He calls it an abomination. He calls it spiritual adultery. I got to read this again because I want you to hear it. For those of you who think, that doing this is okay with God and being a Christian at the same time. What you're saying is, it's okay if my husband has me and another woman in the bed. It's okay if my wife has me and another man in the bed all having sex together. That's what you're really saying. And if you're not willing to deal with it, what makes you think the holy Kadistu God is? And Kadistu means holy without defect. All right, here we go. Ah, and when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. I just felt like that needed repeating. And they shall pass through it 
hardly be stead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. That's what ends up happening. That's what ends up happening. But we're going to talk about also how God blesses and what brings the blessings in. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 11 as we speak. Now, what I want to share with you is God is a jealous God. He has said that so many times in scripture. He doesn't play that two time and stuff. He's not going to be your other lover. He's not going to be your, your good time, Charlie. He's not going to be your John. He's not going to be any of that. He's going to be your one and only true God, or he's not going to be anything at all. Not in your life. It's one or the other. Now you have to decide if you're going to make a choice. One of the things that I noticed, uh, I was going online, you know, getting all these pictures, creating a collage. And what blew me away is all of the allowances that are, are um, permitted in church now. I mean, all kind of allowances. And the, the Bible strictly talks against it in the Old and the New Testament, but the churches are opening their arms. Why? Because they're getting more and more paganistic. They're getting more into paganism and they're allowing it and allowing it and allowing it. That's a very bad place to be, y'all. Even in your personal life, you do not want to live a life of mixed wine. Mixed anything in the Bible is, is a combination of sin as if you're trying to live a life of sin and righteousness at the same time. You take one piece of dirt, you take one thing of bacteria, and you put it in a clean, sterile container, a clean, sterile Petri dish. And then, then this is what we do. We lean to the darkness. You slip that sucker into a dark closet. Pull it out in three days and see what you find. It's not sitting there by itself in a clean environment anymore. It is now surrounded, covered <laughs> with mold. Bacteria grows. Ah, oh, you just have no idea. That's why hospitals have to be so sterile before surgery. Because people die of staph infection. Staph infection comes from bacteria infiltrating the bloodline. You have no idea what you're doing when you dabble as you call yourself a born-again Christian. You have no idea the blessings you short-circuit and the demonic infiltration you are willingly opening the door to. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy. We are here now. All right. Now, in Deuteronomy, therefore, I'm starting at verse one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. That means always. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his stretched out arm, and his miracles and his acts, that uh, which he did in the midst of Egypt, unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and unto all his land. No. And what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses, their chariots, and he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord hath destroyed them unto this day. Now, that's an example right there. Why you don't want to come up against God's people and why you, God's people, don't want to fear the enemy because God's got their number and God's got their payday as well. As you see, the Egyptians paid with their lives. All right, four. Now we go to five. And what he did unto you in the wilderness, unto you, until you came into this place. All right. 
Now I'm going to scroll down because I want to keep going till we get to. All right. So verse 10 for the land, because see, God's got blessings for you. That's if you're willing to do what it takes to get it. See, we're saved by, by faith and salvation comes by grace. It is a gift of God. But maintaining that grace, maintaining that relationship with God is conditional. And here it says right here, for the land and maintaining and getting your blessings as well. For the land, whither thou goest in to possess it, is not as the land of Egypt from whence ye came out, where thou sowest, thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinking water and a rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God cares for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year even to the end of the year. And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Let me stop here real quick. Let me share this with you. You notice how it said in due season. Some of you get weary and well-doing because you forget the script, the, the rest of that sentence that says, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. There are many times when you walk with the Lord, you go through the valley of decision, you make up your mind, now you're in with the Lord, but then you end up going through the valley, I mean, you end up going through the wilderness, the wilderness wanderings, I call it, when it seems like you're all, all up under Satan's attacks and Satan is trying to discourage you from, from getting in tight with the Lord. And you're still kind of caught between two opinions, trying to get yourself, uh, in, in Tao, well, well, uh, versed in the scriptures and understanding the ways of the Lord and all of that. It's an adjustment. It is. And there are things that you have to get used to. There are things that you have to let go of. There are habits that you have to pray away and deliverances that you have to get from God to get out of your flesh and get out of your old way of thinking so that the old man, quote unquote, can die away and you can live in the spirit rather than walking in the flesh. So what ends up happening is when you're doing that, God is setting up blessings for you because God rewards obedience. When you're doing that, God is lining up your destiny and preparing the way ahead of you. He goes ahead of you. He makes the crooked places straight and the rough places plain. What that means is he's smoothing out the roughness and, and he's, he's smoothing out the rough edges and he's preparing a path ahead of you so that you can arrive at your destiny unscathed. But what ends up happening is we get sidetracked by greed, by selfishness, by self-will, by our flesh, by the dictates of our flesh, by wanting to be pleasers, wanting to be liked, and we allow people to intimidate us because we want their approval, and their approval can oftentimes count more, carry more weight in our hearts than God's approval because we see them, the human being. We're in their presence all the time. We don't realize we're in God's presence 24 seven, even more so, but because we haven't experienced him yet, we put more store in what that person says. So if that person threatens our job, if that person threatens our well-being, if that person is intimidating, controlling, and narcissistic, and, and we are passive, we tend to be more, more, we tend to be quicker to yield to what they want, even if we know in our minds it goes against all that God is. 
Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm, I'm trying to slow down here so you can get how life can pull you in a whole bunch of trick bags for a whole bunch of different reasons. They can they can tantalize you with the promise, holding that ca carrot over your head, trying to get you to do what they want you to do because they're going to give you a little money. So because you know you're going to get a little reward and it's going to come right now, you want it now. But God says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Well, okay, that's nice. You're going to strengthen my heart. This is your attitude. But I need you to strengthen my pocketbook and I need the money now. So you end up yielding. You end up compromising. You end up bowing. You end up going along with the flow. Why? Because you know that that's going to satisfy you right now. But what you don't realize, if you you might have canceled the blessing God had for you down the road. See, everything doesn't happen right now. And we're in an instant civilization where everything is, is microwave this and microwave that. And, and, and everything is warp speed this. And you can get this. This will download in, in, in 30 seconds. You can download a whole book and all this nonsense. Nobody wants to wait for anything. You get in line and everybody's about to break out in the fight if they got to wait 10 minutes. My point is, is saying, not only do we have to watch how we treat each other because God takes that personally, we also have to watch how we treat our lives, how we handle the blessings that God has coming our way. Because if we mishandle the blessings, we oftentimes cancel the blessings and we don't realize it because we're in such a hurry so this one over here is gonna is gonna play us for their benefit now they're not really thinking about us because if things go awry they're gonna throw us under the bus they're not gonna have to pay the piper not now god will take care of them but what about you why are you putting yourself at their mercy you know they're wrong you know something's not right about them so why go there because you want your money now. No. No. Don't let anybody pimp you or prostitute you. Don't let anybody cause you to get on the gambling table with your life. Don't gamble your blessings away trying to get a quick fix right now. Don't do that. Be very careful. See, we're living in that time right now where we can be easily tempted. And we have to be very careful. You hear me? Be very careful. Because there are going to be some sly, slick, and wicked tricks coming down the pipe. And these demons are getting slicker and slyer and wickeder. I mean, you know, not that they can get any worse. But the bottom line is man will get worse and worse. The Bible says that. So we have to be very careful. We have to watch keenly. We have to listen keenly. Sometimes the, uh, things can come dressed up as an angel of light. And it looks like a blessing from the Lord. Oh, mercy, look at this. This is God. I know this is God. And God is nowhere in it because he's got your blessing uh, scheduled for, for June of next year. And this person's got something sitting in front of you right now. And you think this is it. But see, if you go for this and you have not acknowledged God in all your ways so he can direct your path, that person could play you for a flunky. You go for the okie doke. You're thrown up under the bus. And that blessing that was sitting there goes to someone else who obeyed God and waited on him. Why? Because God honors obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So, in, so just understand that you've got to be careful how you put one foot in front of the other. You've got to be careful of the choices you make now. And you've got to be careful of the motives behind the choices. Because if your motive is wrong, even though you're doing something that's right, guess what? The results can end up blowing up in your face. Be careful about that one. Lord, I don't know where to take this. This message is going all kind of ways. Whew. Okay, let me go on and finish reading. Verse 15, and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. 16, take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside 
and serve other gods and worship them. I forgot that it said that. Wow. 17. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. And he shut up the heaven. And there be no rain. And that land yield not her fruit. And lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Woo. Therefore shall ye lay up these, these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. For some of you don't know what frontlets are. You see the racehorses, they have these things that are on the right side of the eye and the left side of the eye. It stops the horse from being distracted by activity in their peripheral vision. So they focus on the race. And that's what God wants you and me to do. He wants us to focus on the race, on the path ahead of us. We are to pursue the path he has for us, pursue our destiny, not get sidetracked by everybody else, their nonsense, by, by wizards that peep and mutter and witchcraft and all kind of toys and trinkets that Satan has to pull us off of the beaten path. You do not want to do that. All right. 19. And you shall teach your children and speaking to them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest, by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house and upon thy gates that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. Amen. I'm, I'm going to close with this scripture. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, all those people that are oppressing you, all the abusers, all your enemies. I'm telling you, God's got their payday. Okay. <clears throat> then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours from the wilderness in Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon the land that ye shall tread upon as he hath said unto you. Listen, excuse me, I'm closing. Verse 26 is the last thing I'm going to close with because you can read the rest. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing or a curse. Now, my question to you is which one do you want? See, you could get your blessing at age 30. And God may have your blessing wait until you're age 50. And you may have to go through a whole lot more trials going with God. But one thing that you forget, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So some of you, you want the easy, the fast road. And you don't realize when you go that route and you come out from under the ark of safety, his protection, the obedience of his ways, his plan for your life, his yoke is not there to be easy. His burden is there is not there to be light. And when you go through, baby, you going to go through. It's going to be all on you. And it's going to hurt like you know what. Why? Because you're not getting his help. See, when you go through stuff, in his will, you're getting help from God. And I'm going to close with this. I promise I'm closing right here. I'm going to talk about Moses real quick. And then we're going to end. Moses was directed by God in the wilderness to lead the Israelites where he was right there at the bank of the Red Sea. Pharaoh, God hardens his heart because he got a payday for him. That's the enemy of God's people. They're coming to pursue them, to bring them back into slavery. Ha ha, so they think. But God's got their number and God's got their bill. Check it out. Here they come and they're divided. They're separated. They can see each other. They're within eye view. 
but God has a wall of fire, a pillar of fire that totally separates, that cannot break that, that barrier that God put up. That's the hedge of protection. See, the enemy cannot do to you what God doesn't allow. That's what you keep forgetting. God's the one in control, not the devil, not the enemy, not the people, not your boss, not your husband, not your wife, not your kid, not the one that's got you climbing the walls and pulling your hair out by the root. God's the one in control. So knowing that God's in control, Moses remembered it. So what did Moses do? What God told him to do. They had nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, but check it out. They were in the center of God's will. They were right there where God wanted them to be. Where are you? And while they're right there in the middle, right there in the center of God's will, God's obligated to fulfill his promise. So what does he do? He tells Moses, part those waters. He sticks that stick out, that little rickety stick. The power's in God, not in the stick. And God parts the waters. And the people pass on on dry land. And when they get to the other side, God removes the hedge. The fire goes out. And the Pharaoh and his army, I mean the, the army, comes to pursue them with their dumb behinds. They get out in the middle of these high walls of water thinking they're going to still be able to go get the, the Jewish people. And God waits till they get smack dab in the middle of the ocean. Why? Because his people are smack dab in the, in the center of his will. And God says, watch this. Pow! And Moses sticks his stick out and the water comes together. And not one is left alive. And what does he say? The enemy that you saw today, you will see them no more forever. God knows how to handle your enemies, but are you in the center of his will? Ah, and I'm I'm closing with that. I'm done. God bless you. Think about that. Think about that. God is in control. He's got your future. He's got your back. God bless you as you decide which one you're going to trust.